What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and recently, as sort of an early Christmas present, I bought myself a book that's been on my wish list for quite some time. I've been trying to get my hands on copies of as many historical and technical books on Goju as I can, since I want to hear from Miyagi students firsthand about the history, interpretation, and application of karate, since there's so much myth, malarkey, and machismo in the existing narratives of various lineages. My goal is that by comparing as many perspectives as possible, I can at least filter out some of the noise and get a better picture of the way Goju is supposed to look, historically speaking, and with it, some sense of the direction that we might be able to take with it in the future. The problem, however, is that a lot of these books are either out of print, or they're only printed in Japanese, and that means that they're usually published in Japan, and so the shipping costs of getting them to the United States are well outside of my meager budget. However, fairly recently, a book by Toguchi Seikichi, the student of Miyagi to whom my home dojo traces its lineage, received another print run, meaning that I was able to acquire a copy for the much more reasonable price of about $30. Okinawan Goju Ryu 2, Advanced Techniques of Shoreikan Karate, is a goldmine for historical information, although I'm going to say that the first book in the series is superior when it comes to actual demonstrations of the techniques. The most fascinating part of this book, at least to me, is its first 52 pages, which talk about the history of karate and the theoretical principles that were passed on to Toguchi. Rest assured, I do plan on making many more videos on the content of this book, especially since Toguchi has included some historical photos of himself and his teacher's training, as well as some scans of newspaper announcements and the cover of one of the articles that Miyagi wrote in his own handwriting. However, today I want to focus on an incredibly important section that everyone, or at least everyone who cares about making their karate effective, should read and strive to understand. This is the section on the Kaisai no Genri, the theory of analysis. This theory was designed to interpret and analyze the techniques in kata, and to attempt to determine how to use them in a real combat scenario. So, after you learn these rules, you'll be able to use your kata in an actual fight. Let's get into it. Like many modern karateka and researchers such as Patrick McCarthy and Jesse Enkamp, Toguchi-sensei believes that kata originally stem from two-man tandem sparring sequences, essentially prearranged attack and response patterns that drill a single response to an attack until it becomes almost second nature. This type of training is both incredibly similar to how a lot of modern combat sports-oriented gyms train, as well as being very similar to the section of the bubishi that demonstrates single responses to certain types of attacks. The paired drills that originally made up these techniques were eventually strung together into a longer sequence to serve as a sort of mnemonic device in order to memorize the various drills. Then, in order to be able to practice these techniques even when you don't have a training partner, these drills were adopted into long solo forms, and the techniques were altered in order to make them make a little bit more sense if you don't have the benefit of another body to demonstrate on. However, these primitive sorts of kata were still very long, and often required a lot of space to both practice and perform, making them similar to how some taolu in modern wushu and other Chinese martial arts are practiced to this day. Toguchi speculates that, over time, certain martial artists pared down these forms according to a general set of principles in order to make them easier to practice, easier to remember, and easier to perform. However, over time people have gotten used to practicing just the solo forms, and they slowly started to forget some of the original two-man techniques that had inspired them. Now, some of this may have been as a result of teachers intentionally obscuring their techniques in order to keep them from being discovered by other styles or other fighters, but I at least think it's much more likely that the technical attrition had more to do with passing down the solo form without practicing application than any sort of intentional obfuscation. However, since the kata, even as they're passed down today, were originally developed based on fighting drills that drew on people's actual fighting experience, and since they were adapted according to relatively consistent principles, at least in the theory, Toguchi believed that the original intent of the motion could be determined by following a similarly principled theory of analysis, which he called the Kaisai no Genri. Kaisai was originally written as Toki to Musubi, which translates loosely as pulling apart and rejoining. The shorter phrase kaisai is written with the characters for pulling apart and judging, and it conveys more or less the same process. As with philosophical reasoning, this theory makes use of both deductive and inductive reasoning, the enekiho 
and the kinoho. The deductive method starts from the hyomengi, or the surface techniques of a kata, and seeks to analyze that technique by using the kaisai no genri in order to determine what effects it would have, and therefore what sorts of combat situations it would be best suited for. In the inductive method, you start from a certain type of fighting situation, perhaps one of those presented in Patrick McCarthy's Habitual Acts of Physical Violence theory, and then search within the kata or within several katas for a technical response that would appropriately handle that situation. Either way, though, once one arrives at a kaisaigi, which is a technique that has been analyzed, Toguchi stresses that it has to be tested in an actual drill scenario to determine if it's really effective. Once a kata has been analyzed several or several dozen times, and the meaning of its sequences has been assembled as best as possible, these are put together into a partnered drill that us karateka know as bunkai kumite, which ought to be practiced over and over again until it becomes ingrained in your mind and in your instinctive responses. The goal of this process is to reach something called the kobo no jutsu, the techniques of attacking and defending, that the kata is trying to pass on. So what are the rules of the kaisai no genri that allow you to get to the truth of the kata? Toguchi classifies the rules of his kaisai no genri into two big groups, the shuyo san gensoku, which are the three main principles, and then the hosoku joko, the supplementary principles. This book only really talks at length about the first three rules, but there are lists out there of the others that are assembled from other writings that were done by Toguchi's students, so I'm going to cover those briefly at the end. However, the three main principles are the three main principles for a reason, so those are the ones I'm going to cover in most detail. Starting off we have number one, don't be deceived by the Embusen rule. The Embusen is the line of martial performance, or the directions in which you move when you perform kata. Some of these begin with, or include, turns to the left or to the right, and motion in all eight directions. Many kihongata, such as the gekisai kata and the taikyoku kata, begin with a turn and a block to the left. Toguchi warns us not to interpret this sort of motion as literally fighting against an enemy who's coming from your left side. The basic idea of the embusen was that it was developed as a way of fitting the practice of a kata into a relatively small space. One of my favorite terms that I've heard people use to describe why so many kata seem to have a habit of turning 180 degrees in the middle is the the sensei couldn't afford a bigger dojo turn. Basically though, the less space that you have to work with and the less space you have to practice in, the more useful it is to have a form that stays more or less in the same area. Of course, there are some schools that take the embusen way too literally. One competitive kata rule set requires the performer to return directly to the kiten, the spot from which they began the kata. While there are some kata that do just that, many of them weren't shortened in a way that reliably gets you back to the origin point, which has led a few dojos to implement some truly odd rules where their final closing move involves a very large stepping shift back to the origin or, in one memorable kata, several weird bunny hops. According to Toguchi's theory, these techniques aren't actually part of the kata, and so they don't really need to be interpreted when you're trying to determine the meaning of a technique. Number two, techniques executed while advancing imply attacking techniques. Techniques executed while retreating imply defensive techniques. While the exact pattern of stepping in kata might not be as important as some people believe, the motion of your feet is still very important in interpreting the kata. While modern karate tends to divide techniques into strikes and blocks, the original two mandrills that these were based on put a lot more emphasis on the general motion of the body and relative positioning. Because of the classification of distinct techniques within these broader sequences, some offensive techniques were miscategorized as blocks, despite not really being defensive techniques whatsoever. One of the supplemental rules deals with this in more detail, but many of the blocking techniques are intended as joint manipulations, or seizing techniques, or even sometimes strikes, depending on your interpretation. The example that Toguchi gives in the book is the sequence in Seiyunshin where one steps into a low stance and delivers what looks like a down block before stepping back and doing the same. According to this theory, the first of those techniques has to be interpreted as some sort of attacking technique, and the interpretation taught by most Shoreikan lineage schools bears this out, interpreting it generally as being a strike to the elbow of an arm that's grabbed by the other hand. Number three, there is only one enemy and they are in front of you. Have you ever heard a kata being described as a choreographed fighting dance against multiple imaginary opponents? Well, Toguchi Seikichi called from 1998, and he says that description is full of shit. Similarly to principle number one, 
This principle says that you shouldn't necessarily interpret, for instance, a turn to the left as being a defense against an attacker who's coming from the left. If you're aware of someone who's trying to hurt or attack you, the natural response is to turn to face them so that you can see them and react to their attacks. If the enemy is behind you or on your sides, turning to face them should be the first thing that happens before anything else. Now, you might be moving at a relative angle to your opponent, such as the first sequence in Sypho where you step diagonally to the side, but you should still be facing in the direction of the person you're fighting. There are some people who interpret certain techniques as being responses to multiple attackers, usually blocking techniques where one hand comes up high and the other hand sweeps down low, for instance. The best practice when fighting multiple opponents, other than praying if you're the praying sort, is to attempt to position yourself so that you're only having to face one of them at any given time. So those are the three main principles, and after those we have the Hosoku Joko, the supplementary principles that clarify some of the vaguer or more specific aspects of the Shuyo San Gensoku. As I mentioned, these supplementary principles aren't written in this specific book, but several people have put together a likely list of the principles that Toguchi taught by reading through and compiling some of the writings made by his students. It's possible that since Toguchi doesn't give a specific number for how many of these principles are, that there are an indefinite number, or even that this is kind of a catch-all for principles that are designed to be added as necessary if a situation that hasn't been dealt with comes up. However, here's a quick rundown of the common principles that I found. Every movement in kata has a fighting application. That is to say that movements that get interpreted as salutations aren't really symbolic opening movements, unless, of course, they were added after the fact to specifically serve that purpose. A closed hand returning to chamber usually has something in it. This means that the oft-maligned chamber hand or hikite technique usually indicates some sort of grab, rather than being just a resting or a loaded hand, or a hand that has been for some weird reason taken out of guard. Utilize the shortest distance to your opponent. This one's more or less self-explanatory. If you control an opponent's head, you control an opponent. The head is generally a good target for striking, as well as for clinching, although technically with a clinch you're controlling the arms and shoulders and using those to control the head most of the time. There are no blocks. This is partially a linguistic nitpick, as the term uke, which gets translated as block in English, really means something more like receive. But more specifically, this principle refers to the fact that techniques that look like or get interpreted as blocks are more likely to be throwing or grabbing or joint locking techniques, or occasionally to be indicative of some type of guard. Angles in kata are important. Basically, if something like a turn is executed while doing a technique, then you can consider that turn to be part of the technique usually signifying the relative position that you're supposed to take in regards to your opponent. My go-to example is the sequence at the end of Sypho where you turn 180 degrees and do a sweeping ridge hand, which indicates something like taking your opponent's back and then getting them in something that resembles a rear naked choke. Touching your own body in kata indicates that you're touching part of your opponent. This is just a general warning to remember that it's hard to model interaction with someone else's body when you're doing a solo routine. Don't attack hard parts of your opponent with hard parts of your body. This is a concept that's very similar to something that judo uses. Rather than try and match strength against strength, you should try and strike at your opponent's anatomical weak points like the temple or the solar plexus, and then to redirect or control your opponent rather than directly trying to tough through their attack. And finally, there are no pauses in application, or as I like to call it, why are you stopping? Why are you stopping? And that's all of them. The Kaisai no Genri seems to provide a relatively strong framework for trying to interpret what the kata are trying to teach. But, as should really be obvious, these are rules of thumb, and they're definitely not guarantees that you're going to reach a correct interpretation. Toguchi warns that if you don't test these Kaisaigi in a real fight, or at least in a real sparring situation, you might find that an interpretation that seems perfectly logical to you in your mind actually breaks down under the worst test of all, mild pressure. <laughs> Basically, pressure test your bunkai, pressure test your bunkai, oh my god, pressure test your bunkai, please. However, they may be rules of thumb, but they're very useful rules of thumb that you can apply to your own bunkai, you know, when we're eventually able to practice in person again. I absolutely recommend going through one of your kata, or even several of your kata, and trying to apply this theory in order to understand what the proper application for certain techniques really is. 
Towards the end of the book, Toguchi presents the kata and the bunkai for Saifa, where we get to see a little bit of how his own application of this theory works in an actual kata. Now, his interpretation of the second sequence, which includes the scooping and lower sweeping blocks, shows them as being catching techniques, which is something that, based on my interpretation, I personally disagree with. I think that they represent a manner of getting a position in a clinch and then being able to deliver a knee strike before going back into a sprawl. Because the original partner drills and sequences were lost, no matter how good your interpretive framework is, you're never going to be able to fully reconstruct the historical reality of how it was practiced. But using the signposts in the Kaisai no Genri, we can come as close to a correct interpretation as we're realistically ever going to be able to get. Thank you for watching another one of my videos. I had a lot of fun working on this one, and as I mentioned in the opening sequence, you can expect me to make quite a few more videos with the information that is in this little book. If you'd like to see those videos, then you can subscribe to this channel, why not? And even turn on notifications so that you can see those videos right when they come out. And if you liked this video, there's a button somewhere down around this way uh, that you can click to let me know about that. In the comment box below, you should totally let me know what your favorite kata or favorite kata sequence is. I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and you really should be practicing your kata right now.